Welcome to the Haunted Hacker Podcast, April version one. Uh, tonight we have Mick Douglas, a good friend of mine um, from way back when. And uh, before we get started, we'll start with a little bit of news. Um, so this month I'll be speaking in DC for TechStrong at TechStrong Live and doing an Android hacking workshop. Uh, also, um, I will be speaking at We Fight Fraud in London for Tony Sales and that crew. So without further ado, let's introduce my buddy, Mick Douglas from way back in Bank of America Times. How you doing, buddy? Doing awesome, man. Real awesome. glad to be on the show. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we could finally link up and, and make it work, man. Um, yeah, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and, and what brought you to cyber and what you're doing now? Well, so uh, my name is Mick Douglas, and um, I actually got into cyber kind of in a weird way um, uh, around uh, the 2000s. I was a Unix admin at UUNet. Now, uh, the whippersnappers out there don't know what UUNet is, but they were the ISP for ISPs. So like AT&T and Comcast and all of those like we controlled the North American internet backbone, like effectively most of it. Right. And um, man, I would have been riding that job until retirement. Like I loved it there, but then there was the WorldCom fraud that happened. Mm -hmm. UUNet was a subdivision of them. And so I got bounced out and then um, uh, kicked around for a couple different jobs and then wound up working at a marketing firm and I was doing kind of like, it, it always kind of done some security forward sysadmin stuff because I always kind of liked it. But we had this pen test and we got lit up. I mean, it was like, the, it, 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 it right? Like it, it's the, the tail, right? Like when it's your first pen test, they just, you're destroyed you know, from the feet up. I mean, it's like, and it was a bloodbath. So we got this um, pen test report and it was basically like they dunked it in red ink shook it off a little bit and said hey fix it all and so like in the debriefs i said like hey like like tell me more about this like what's going on like because the only thing that i knew from a security like hacker kind of perspective at that point was sql injection and that was it like i didn't understand any of the other stuff and like apparently neither did this pen test firm because i was asking them like well, how do we like do this? Like, how do we get, and basically their advice was like, don't suck. And I was like, that's not at all helpful. And then in the readout, they said this, they were like, well, while I'm sure you tried your best, it wasn't good enough. And I was like, whoa. <clears throat> and like, you know me, right? <laughs> so they threw that gauntlet down and I picked that slum bitch right up and the next, like, and I burned the OT on this because, like, my pride was on the line here. So I studied up, like, how to patch, how to configure, and I got all that in. And then I started putting in honey pots and all kinds of other stuff. Like, I had failed a ban and all nice. this stuff. And the pen testers, so they were uh, going to come back in, like, uh, six months later. We got ready beforehand, and I was like, nah. Bring it. Come on. Come on, Cletus. <laughs> Bring it. And they came in and they got their asses handed to them. And Sweet. what they wanted to do, what they were saying is like, oh, you need to turn off your firewalls. And it's so hard. And I was like, oh, my God. Suffer. <laughs> and then then what I said, like we were having like was like Wednesday when we're having this like midweek thing. And they're like complaining. Like, oh, it's so hard to hack these guys now. And what I said is, while I'm sure you're trying your best, and there was just this, like, oh. Crickets. And that was when, like, the marketing firm was like, man, this dude's like, like he's a sysadmin for real, but, like, security, he's angry. <laughs> like, let's keep him doing nice. that. And so then uh, just that was, like, when I kind of went full time. So it was, like, I don't know, it would have been, like, 2007-ish. Nice. And then we got together at bank of america mm -hmm. and had a pretty epic fucking crew over there oh, when, I look, when i look back to, to when i look back to all the names we had on our little small team and look at what everybody's doing now like yeah. that was a, that was like the nba version of the dream team dude it was it was stacked and like some of the stuff that we did 
Mm-hmm. Like, I, like, yeah, it was just, it was quality. It was a fun gig. Um, yeah. 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 That was, that was probably one of my favorite jobs uh, in security was Bank of America. So I, I'd been there twice. I was there as a contractor doing Foundstone, left, came back, and went to threat management, and then from threat management to the red team. And that, that team, I still remember like going to Vegas, you know, with Josh and during DEF Con and stuff. It yeah. was just, it was one of those things where that's a once in a lifetime chance where everybody's at the same place at the same time at that company. Uh, oh, and there, yeah. there's still a lot of people there too. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think uh, so. Mars is still there. Um, mm-hmm. A couple of them have like moved off into like different teams and stuff, and are doing like really cool stuff. Like Rob Devita, hey buddy, mm-hmm. yeah. um, he's doing like all kinds of skunk work stuff, in which like really right, like that is his jam. Yeah. So yeah, 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 Robin, yeah. It, was a, it was a real yeah. blast. Rob's a good dude. I I had a lot of fun with Rob, especially when we went to uh, Charlotte. So yeah, it was a. Uh, Good times, man. So what are you doing now? So uh, now I'm running my own consultancy. So InfoSec Innovations is my company. I'm building up my own crew. And um, uh, then I'm also, I still teach for SANS. Mm -hmm. And I'm also a member of the INS faculty. So um, basically help advise folks, write position papers, give like little webinars and stuff. And on uh, SANS, on the SANS side, I teach um, 504, which is the hacker techniques and incident oh, yeah. response. Yeah. And then I also teach 555, which is the SIM, like how to build a tactical SIM and like really make it hot rod and yeah. like, do crazy stuff with a SIM. So so the tactical uh, hacking and, and it's a response, is that, that's a GHPQ or G- No, what that's the GCIH. G-I-H. Yes, there you go. GHTQ is the other one I was looking at. Um, yeah, that, that's one of the first certs I got was the GCIH, uh, GHTQ. Um, a lot of fun. Uh, you know, SANS has some good courses. It just seems like over the years, the courses at SANS have really developed. And then some of the other certifications, well, maybe names, but they become like Cracker Jack. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where the DOD requires a specific certification and it's just crap. And, yeah. you know, I, ha- I had a talk with someone not too long ago about certifications. It was, oh, yeah, Tanya Jenka. And oh, yeah. we were talking, um, we did a recording. It's not released yet, but okay. waiting for some business deals of hers to go through before we release it. But we were talking about certifications and how ridiculously expensive it is for someone trying to get an entry-level job into the industry. Yeah, well, it can be. Um, so it depends on, so... It depends on what your path is, right? Um, I think that, you know, like some of the things that I get confused by is, I think that certs are showing that you hit a minimum competence level. Mm -hmm. And so if you're trying to get like an entry level gig, you should probably be shooting for an entry level cert. Right. And um, so that's where things like, like CompTIA Security Plus might be a good thing for right. getting your foot in the door. And, um, you know, the, the other thing that folks can do, if you really want to show that you've got like the, you're on the, on the bounce and you're, you're like somebody that they should take a, like a stab with is like, you should um, do things like contribute to mm-hmm. different open source projects. And, you know, it, like the one thing that always like in, I know, and I don't mean to scrape a raw nerve or nothing, but I know I'm about to. Um, you, more than anyone else, knows that like that whole BS, like, oh, if you don't code, are you really an infosec, bro? <laughs> so I'm trying to couch it so I don't have you go critical mass. <laughs> but like that, like that is just a broken thought pattern, and I wish we could chunk it. But exactly. like, if you're like trying to get into InfoSec, like, you know, what would be like a real baller thing for you to do is like download a tool, run mm-hmm. it. And if it doesn't work, like double check the documentation and, and then like Makes put it. in an issue. Yeah. Like, I think that it, I'll tell you this. I had one of um, one of my interns that went through my uh, uh, program. We have an internship program and then uh, went off to go do interesting stuff on their internship resume. What they did is they said, um, contributed to various open source projects and then they said i opened x number of tickets and issues 
or nice. I contributed this much of documentation. And I was like, hell yeah. Like that shows that they're more than just like an enthusiast. They're like actually leaning in and doing stuff. So like yeah. there's, you know, there's an opportunity to like participate and do stuff and like certs. I, I don't know. How, gosh, I gotta be careful how I say this. Um, certs can be important, mm -hmm. but if you are applying for an org and they're like, Hey, you need these letters or don't apply. That's, that's actually telling you a lot about what that org is. Right. If you don't have those letters after your name, you got to ask yourself, well, do I want to work here bad enough to go get those letters? Or is that telling me that me and this org aren't going to be a fit or maybe not ever going to be a fit? Right. And a lot of people, like, I don't know, like a lot of the, the cert granting organizations kind of make, make you feel like you have to have a cert yeah. in order to have a gig. And I had my first couple security gigs without a cert. And right now there's gosh what are we at like three million job openings mm -hmm. like there, you, there's opportunities if you look around for stuff without certs yeah for sure and when you look back at, at kind of like when when i got into the business there weren't a whole lot of certs to be had there definitely was no sure. hacking certs um it was mostly just you know security it wasn't anything offensive um but yeah like i tell my interns and people that are applying for internship is that you know, I don't necessarily need a cert for you to be an intern, be hired at my company. What I need is to see that you're actually doing something. Um, so I tell people, hey, you know, start a project, put some on GitHub, you know, yep. write a little bit of code, do some research and publish what you find. It doesn't have to be groundbreaking. It doesn't have to be, you know, cutting edge. Just do something and research it and post the, the notes and documentation yep. because well, that's what you're even, doing. Yeah, or even, even if like coding's not your thing, right? Like, do a blog posting, do, um, uh, you know, do uh, like a walkthrough on how to set up a lab, like do, do something, you know, and put it out there. Um, you know, I, I, you know, the thing that like does make me angry, and, and this might ruffle some feathers, but the feathers can be ruffled, and they can be wrong. Yep. There's a lot of folks that are like, oh, you know, it's so elitist that you have to have a GitHub or that you got to do this stuff. Well, I'm sorry. Let's review here. You don't have a cert. You don't have a GitHub. You don't have a this. You don't have a this. Why? Like, what the hell? Why should I even have an interview with you, let alone hire you? Like, I'm hiring you to fix something. You got to show me that you can do. And I get it. Life is tough. You got other commitments. You got, like, family issues. You got other, like, I get it. I get it. And I, you know, I, I realize that I've had lucky breaks. I get that. But you can't just like roll up to a, a, a bank and be like, give me job. Because that's how it works. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. Like when, when I first started getting into security and like well, really pen testing, um, I was working over NEC Unified. And what we did was I created a vulnerable network and had people sit down and they had couple hours to go through it and just hit whatever they found and it wasn't to see if they could hack into a machine it was more of let me see how your mind works let me see what you go after let's see how you go after this and you know we had a firefall um, come in and he he applied for the job um we didn't end up working together but i mean really good friends he's a great guy and really super smart but the the way that we engineered it was so that you can see which way they went through the network um, and you can see, you know, exactly what they were thinking. And, and afterwards we had them give us like a breakdown, like a debrief and a report. Uh, and you didn't have to have a cert. And that, that's what I really liked about it was I was able, I was given freedom to just say, okay, this is how we're going to do it. And if, if we think that you're good enough, we'll hire you. And then I saw later on that coal fire took like the same type of mentality about it. Um, they had the sort of like a gauntlet that you had to go through and, and pick a bunch of uh, vulnerable machines and report about it. And what's funny is I'm actually working with one of the guys from Coal Fire now, Luke McComey. So it's, the whole world came like, you know, round again, full circle. Um, so looking back at, at the days that, you know, that since I've known you, what would you say is your favorite hack? Um... You mean like thing, like thing that I've personally done? 
Um, yeah. You've done a lot. So. Yeah. So the the one that I did is um, there's a there's a uh, PowerShell script that I wrote years ago called Pause Process, mm-hmm. and that thing is bonkers and like nobody's really picked it up and i don't get why i'm gonna retweak it and try to get it a little more uh, out there so so check this out and this is get ready to be kind of wowed because this is really bizarre so in every version of the windows kernel going all the way back to windows xp wow. there's actually a built-in debug function inside the kernel and microsoft has like they're there's a call, like a stub call out that, oh yeah, this is a function, but yeah. it's not like fully documented out, or at least when I was playing with it a couple of years ago, it wasn't fully documented out like the other API calls are on the kernel or the other .NET components. Mm. And so I was like, debug, what? And started like poking at this thing. And I, I'll never forget, I was it was actually DerbyCon one evening I, after like all the shenanigans were done and I'm like hacking away and I had this notepad instance up and running that was my target uh, process mm. and I like finally hit the thing right and I clicked into notepad and I couldn't drag it around I couldn't do anything with it and I was like nice what the hell is this and so the the um like I started messing around with it and the whole thing then once I started playing with it is I realized that you can use this for some really dank incident response. Oh, and yeah. So what I've done with a couple of my clients is like, they're like, Hey, we think attackers are in the network and they've migrated into like this process or they've taken over this process. <laughs> what you do, boom, yep. pause it. And then you can investigate. And in some cases, Oh, false alarm. You mm-hmm. can unattach that debug the application keeps running. And here's the thing that's even more cool is any transactions that were sent to that process while it was in that pause state, it's in a FIFO buffer and then it just completes. Completes. Nice. Nice. So like you wouldn't want to run it in like like a on like a manufacturing or something where like real time needs to be done. But I like see, yes. yeah. but you won't know. So bad. But like for anything else, like like in, like most business apps, you can just pause, like take a few minutes, like what's going on here, and then if you're like, word, this is evil, like kill it or right. like do other interdictions. But like, and I, for reason, like I thought that vendors would steal this and make this their own thing, but nobody's touched it. And wow, like I'm I'm gonna have to try to like push it a little more. So that I think that's my Real. favorite hack, just because like it. That one's got some real like teeth yeah. on it. Yeah, for real. And all the instant responses I've done in the past year, if I would have had that tool, it'd have been golden. Because I can't count how many times I would go after a process and kill the process and it respawn. You know, yeah. and it, they oh, would yeah, eject, yeah, yeah. they would eject yeah. the ransomware into a legit process. And when you would kill it, it would either crash the whole entire stack. Because the way that they built the ransomware was intentionally to do that because they wouldn't keep that process alive. Or it would just right. like respawn ten more, yeah. Right. So here's here's one thing that like and I'll tell you this, man. Like we need to jam on this. Yeah. Um, using WQL, I've mm. um, enhanced it a little bit, and so what you could do is make like a trigger condition. And one of the things that I've been playing around with is if this process touches too many files too fast, paused. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's some good blue team shit right there too. Yeah, yeah. I like so that. like, I think that there's stuff we can do. Um, Josh Johnson, a buddy of mine, made this one um, uh, variant of it uh, where he uses that technology or that technique, mm-hmm. and it is silly cool. He calls it by Felicia, but oh, nice. uh, not by Felicia. He calls it by Fafisha, Fafisha. Like fishing. Mm-hmm. And what it does is it uh, looks at the um, uh, process list. Uh-huh. And if you're a browser and Outlook is the parent, so you click the link in the email, it checks to see if that page is on like um, the Google known malware sites. Uh-huh. And it'll just like pause that browser tab, the process, not the, the window, just that process. It's like, yo, you went to a phishing site, you hit okay and it kills that process. Like there's nothing you can do. Yeah. So like there's, 
like there's there's a lot there to like play with and i i want to jam on that and explore that space that sounds yeah yeah that sounds badass so power show man like i've lived off of power show for probably the last 10 years like you know oh, wow. just this, the stuff that i've been working with um i had the usb that i had told you about previously that you know goes out and does remote execution and all that good stuff um and then now i'm working on one uh on android not powershell but it's android apks so i've been really focusing on breaking android down to pieces and i've got a, a an exploit now that um, so pegasus malware if you think about that and how much it siphons out of you know the devices this takes it the next stage so you know there, there's certain things on devices that have their applications maybe vpns that uh, require authentication this steals that authentication rotatingly so it's gonna be really really cool i have a i have a meeting in dc um, this month so i'm gonna see you know what we can what they think about it where it's gonna go um, maybe sign an nda if not then i'm just gonna release it and it, it's pretty cool, but I've been, I spent the last two years working on it. Um, so yeah, I mean, That's like, cool. yeah, it, it's it was really interesting because when I set it up, I put the okay, theoretically, I put the exploit on AWS, and you know, a lot of people grabbed the file, whatever, and it ran its course. And I thought, okay, well, it'll grab me a snapshot of my target, but it didn't do that. What it did was. It grabbed the snapshot snapshot of the target every time that target changed. So when I woke up in the morning, I had something like five gigs worth of data. And the data was all of those rotating numbers, if you get what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I was shocked. I like ripped it down. I was like, oh my God, this is this is big. This could be really big. So I've kind of I've been sitting on that for a couple months now and uh, when i go to dc i'm going to talk to a couple people and, and see what they want to do with it if they don't want it then i'll just keep it for myself and probably release it quietly but um yeah man so what else have you been up to i, I know you're still speaking and, and doing sand stuff like anything new yep. coming up or um well actually i kind of took a break um from the speaking stuff so um um i hadn't done much con stuff for a bit um uh the virtual cons just i, I couldn't get into them i mean i i did a couple of them i just it, they weren't my bag um i'm trying to get back into that uh to the con scene mm -hmm. um well derby con i mean that's the, when uh, when is derby con is no that the more. one they killed that's when they killed right yeah yeah, yeah. that's the, that and um knowing the folks like hey hey derby con peeps um it just like the con became so much work mm. that so um for a while i worked at binary defense mm. so the sister company of trusted sec and i was floored by how many times a week they had evening working sessions mm -hmm. and it basically uh, started becoming a second job for them Ooh. and um you know like you know like how i don't know about you but like if somebody like says like you have to do this thing like instantly the fun level drops fun goes down yeah yeah like you you better eat that ice cream cone god damn it <laughs> i wanted to enjoy the ice cream and that's what happened for the con it just became like too big too much work yeah. too much effort and so i get it like I, I would rather that they let it retire and like go out with a bang than just fizzle and get yeah uh, yeah, I totally so, get that. Um, yeah, um, but I will say that the good, uh, like a really cool, uh, the two cons that I really enjoy are um, Wild West Hack and Fest, which is mm -hmm. in Deadwood, and then there's uh, Way West Hack and Fest. Yeah, yeah, I haven't been to either one of those yet. Um, you did? I didn't go to DefCon this year either. Uh, I heard that was kind of crazy, uh, but I, you know, I go to so many conferences every year to like speak. And then by the time it gets around to Vegas, I'm white, man. It's like a year just nonstop. Um, but yeah, so Kim is with us. Kim is the co-host, uh, the new co-host, the new old co-host. Uh, Kim's, <laughs> Kim's been around the podcast since it started. Um, she was actually one of the first guests. Uh, and Kim has been to a shit ton of conferences as well. Um, I have been. 
but I uh, want to give you a chance to on this past year. And yes, it was uh, quite crazy. It wasn't, I, I will have to, I will say because of the whole COVID and like the, the lack of people, it was way different than I can assume any other like DEF CON ever was. So um, it'll be interesting. I know like lots of things are changing and there's been like, you know, some drama here and there, but you know, like, I don't know. I mean, conferences are amazing for the things that you can see, but you can also see everything on, on you know, Twitch or YouTube now. So, um, you know, other than meeting people in person, um, it'll be kind of interesting to see how things continue on. Um, I know there's like ShmooCon and all kinds of, uh, you know, I don't know, like, what's your, your opinion, Mick? Like, you've been to a ton of them. And as far as like DEF CON, uh, Wild uh, West Hacking Fest, I've really wanted to go to, I think the way that they've like promoted themselves, um, they've done a really great job and it kind of seems more to the back to the basics versus like the big party out Vegas, you know, do all this. Um, what's your opinion on that? Well, so different cons kind of hit different crowds, you know, mm -hmm. like some people really dig the Vegas party scene of DEF CON. Um, I, like, I come from a real small town and, like, not, not super duper small, but small, right? And, like, big crowds kind of weird me out. And, like, I go to DEF CON every, you know, two, three years, and I enjoy myself, but, like, at a certain point, I'm like, I need to find a quiet place. Yes. And, like, go, go kind of decompress. Um, you know, but, like, other cons, like, kind of, like, there's a, a con we sponsor in Columbus, Ohio, called um, Hackers Teaching Hackers, and nice. we've got, like, a really different um, setup, like, day one of the con, it's all villages, and it's just all hands-on, get your hack on, like, tear apart a car, tear apart an ICS, nice. and then um, the next day is, like, a more traditional con, where it's con talks. So, like, if you're, like, somebody that, like, me learns by, like, I got to get my hands on stuff, you know, that might be the type of con for you. So, it just really depends on what you're into and what you're after, um, you know. And, uh, like, there's the thing that I'm kind of uh, getting a new appreciation for are the non-hacker cons. Mm -hmm. So, like, um, like, more of the GRC crowd, which is, like, you know, that's the other side of the InfoSec coin. And it's kind of cool to, um, I'm, I'm trying to get on the speaking slot on a couple of those. And, um, you know, I think that the, that'll be kind of like an interesting thing to be like, what's up? Let's, <laughs> let's talk about like, here's, here's how attackers really go after your network. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just fun. I love the fact that there's so many different cons out there now. Although it does get confusing on like, like to your point, Mike, like you're, you're saying you're going all over the place. Like, if you wanted to, I think you could just go con to con to con at this point. Yeah, now. yeah. and it's crazy, too. You, you should connect with uh, Gerald Osier on his podcast. Okay. He's big, right. big into GRC. Uh, really good guy, too. All uh, right. He uh, is on the board of my nonprofit that I just started. Uh, we're still waiting on the tax EIN number, but, um, yeah, it's going to be kind of cool. It's uh, Hackers for Vets, so just for veterans. Um, you know, oh. trying to get them, you know, scholarships to take certification courses, buy equipment, whatever they need to get like going or whatever. Um, yeah, so I went to a really cool ass conference uh, last a couple weeks ago, and it was in Hershey, Pennsylvania, which I've never been before. Okay. And it was at the it was at the Hershey Lodge, which I've never been before. <laughs> And yeah. everything smelled like fucking chocolate. Um, well, that makes sense. <laughs> right? But it, it was uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Education Conference. And it was really eye-opening because I think I was the only one that was speaking about cybersecurity the entire conference. And when I was bringing up like certain things that, that teachers should know or parents should know about like discord or gaming or you know what to look for if a kid is kind of going off the right path right and they had no idea like they literally didn't even know these platforms and it just i mean i always preach about how parents are so disconnected and they need to get involved and, and learn these platforms sit with the kids you know and learn what they're doing um, and get involved because that's the only way to keep them out of trouble but you know I, I was showing like really simple hacks and the people there were just like Oh my God, they can do that. I was like, oh, th this is why we're fucked right here. 
Um, so yeah, it, I mean, it was, what's that? What's that? <laughs> There's a lot of reasons. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I look back and not only the fact that like, to a certain extent, I will say that parents have more of a reason to be disconnected now because they're working yeah. more hours, they're making less money. Like it's not the, the mom staying at home. I mean, even back in the sixties, like what did they used to do when mom needed time? Go outside, come back when the lights are, you know, like, come Smoked, on, right? or whatever, you know, and, you know, you could have set the whole world on fire. I mean, like, I'm sorry, but kids have lighters, you know, same kind of concept, except now it's a lot worse because there's so much information available. But, you know, I, I look at TV and I see these like television shows trying their best to talk about hospital hacks or things that have happened in the news. And then they try to relate them to people and, and people still, they, they still don't get it. They're just like, oh, that still, that happens. Like, I'm not worried about it. I have bad credit. Well, yeah, but does your kid, does, do you like, have you ever been evicted? Like that can affect you if somebody steals your identity. Trying to prove yourself back is kind of crazy. Yeah. And yeah, like it is, it's, I mean, we just don't pay attention. And we, we don't like people yeah. are trying to tell us. <laughs> I wish somebody still in my identity, but it still hasn't happened. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah, like the, the conference scene, I, I feel like it's really changed, right? So before I left for, for London, um, I had gone to DEF CON, you know, years back and it was a certain way. Um, that was back when it was still at, I want to say Rio. You, um, uh, yeah, you would have been, no, uh, or was that Riviera? Actually, Riviera, like Riviera. Riviera. Yeah, 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 it was with Riviera. That's where me, yeah, when I'm with Josh and all that. Um, but yeah, like going going from that conference to being in Europe for a couple of years and coming back, and just it seems like the scene has changed. And I, I don't know if it's always been this way, and I just haven't been tapped into it. But like, I I look on Twitter, and it's almost like, and I, I really hate Twitter with a passion. I really hate it. But it's like people try to find reasons to flame, you know, or, or they try to ignite some kind of, you know, war wagon or something. And I don't understand that. I, I've never really understood it, but it, I don't know if I was not tapped into it. And I am now or what it was, but it's no, something new dude, to me. No, 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 no. no? I'm going to, I'm going to bring it back old school. Okay. How, was Usenet civil? Oh, good point. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, was IRC civil? Right? Never. <laughs> we were there. It was every yeah. bit the shit show. The truth. It's like, yeah. people are jerks. Film at 11. I do think that um, the thing that's a little slightly different, though, is um, Twitter, because it's so brief, mm. unlike like a Usenet posting where you could be a little more nuanced, with Twitter, it's like you can just like lob a hand grenade, and you kind of almost have to weaponize it to right. make to get that engagement. Whereas with like like the Usenet postings, like some people like wrote like like massive theses. Yeah. So yeah, you're you know, right. IRC was a shit show. Yeah, but but the saving grace <laughs> is unless somebody like copy pasted it, like it would just scroll off and you wouldn't yeah. hear from it again. And yeah. so, like, but yeah, no, 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 no. people were always jerks. I yeah, think sure. that um, I, I do think, though, that the um, there is a contingency of folks that have figured out that, like, um, uh, by kind of curating outrage and like mm. keeping that going, that they can kind of be somebody you know, as a leader of a type, mm. and you know, they kind of are. It's just they're leading an angry mob and so yeah. you know more well, power to them i guess but at the same that's time, not a scene. like social media now has with all of the algorithms and everything i mean like it seems like we're all just talking to a mad vacuum right like every once in a while because we've all been talking about the certifications and we've been talking about this forever it seems you know and maybe there's been some kind of change in a little bit but overall like I think the, the problem I have right now is like Twitter, I see the same people, LinkedIn, I see the same people. I have to go and physically go like, 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 and then those people pop up more. Well, I mean, I want to see them, but I want to see everyone else. So, I mean, 
like that angry, it seems like you almost have to do that, like angry, like mob mentality. You've got to get people mad or super excited or something drastic has to happen for the algorithm to go, okay, we're going to take this a little further out, you know, and, and kind of like brand it out. So um, how do you feel about that? Like versus IRC back in the day? Like, I mean, yeah, things did happen. Do you think it's more productive or have we lost the productivity of what ML is trying to do with us with social media? I know there's a huge like trend of trying to fix those those issues of like how do we ethically and you know responsibly make sure kids aren't going to go kill themselves because they saw too many of XYZ or somebody said eat Tide Pods. Yeah. <laughs> or eat Tide Pods, right. Well, so I think that there's and I'd be lying if I said I didn't think a lot about this. Like, this is something that really kind of low-key terrifies me. Um, I think that in some ways, the algorithms actually work for good in some use cases. So, like, like-minded people, like, find, like, a support group and, like, hey, here's, like, I'm dealing with this thing. And, like, there's, um, I, I've noticed that since I've kind of been tweeting a little bit more about, like, incident response and kind of forensic -y things that I'm getting more of that in my feed. And that's been like actually really helpful for me. But I, I know firsthand from a friend's, um, uh, one of my friends, um, his daughter uh, recently graduated from college and she like I, on a different platform, like started talking about like some body image type stuff and all of a sudden she gets this like, hey, yeah, you are too fat. You need to just like have Whoa. a stick of gum for dinner. And wow. because the way the algorithms work, right, you, that's what you start getting and you get more of that. And like it, like whatever you focus on, like in life, you kind of manifest more of that. And I know that sounds super hippy dippy, but I, I really do believe that. And on social media, it's like, boom, yeah. way elevated. And those algorithms are like hyper efficient. And so like, if you're doing like good and healthy kind of social media, you're probably going to be getting some good and healthy stuff. If you're not though, man, you're on a trail of woe with like greased skids. And so like, I, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, Kim. I really couldn't. Yeah. It's also kind of scary because at the same time, you don't want to have an algorithm that only gives you what you want to hear because that creates this, that's how we get so divided. That's partially what's happened here in the United States and across the, the world is because we've been so divided because we only hear what everybody wants. Well, whatever we want to hear overall, we don't. And like sometimes people, you know, it's good to have constructive criticism. And that's how ML hasn't figured out what constructive criticism is. If I'm gained some weight and, you know, hey, my friend, hey, you've gained a little bit of weight, you know, like whatever, like, have you done something different? Is there something going on? That's different than saying, hey, you're fat, eat a carrot, you're sick, you know? <laughs> and then having like 200 people you don't know, like do the same thing, absolutely. So yeah, it's, it's pretty frightening to see like kind of how this is going to kind of play out. But I've, it just, it's kind of disheartening. I don't want to keep talking into a vacuum. If I wanted to yeah. talk to a vacuum, but that's where our, that's where our facts come from. Like, if I have a question about the world, I go to the facts, which is social media, right? Like, <laughs> right. it's legit news <laughs> in yeah. some part of the world. Man, people just and well, I mean that that takes a lot. You know, like people don't like take five different sources. They take their one source of, you know, and this got time. Yeah. He's got time though. That's the thing right. that like I would love, like, like so. I'm going to try not to violate any NDAs here, but like Mike has had career gigs where he's like spending that time and getting all that alternate like news feeds, mm -hmm. synthesizing it, packaging it up, analyzing it and giving a portfolio of curated news that an organization cares about. And the reason that like an organization does that because they care and they have the money to do it. Right. Like, I, I, like I, I don't know what like I hate I, I don't know how we could do it like it sounds super undemocratic but like it would be hella cool if there were some way to have like an actual peer-reviewed mm. true neutral news source and they're just like yo like both sides in the middle eat it this is the facts right 
here you go. But like how, how like nobody would advertise on that. Like yeah. it would have to somehow be funded. Like I don't know how to do that. PBS. Peer reviewed. You got, you got ideas? Well, what what is what is your thought process on the whole Web three? So I'm kind of delving okay. into the new Web three like realm, kind of checking it out. It actually gives me a lot of hope. Like people are really kind of going. Nobody nobody knows what they're doing. They're just throwing. We're just going to end up in the same mess and. Possibly, but here's the thing. Yes, of course they had to throw, you have to build something and then break it because that's what hackers do. And that's that's how you find problems. But at least this time around there, it seems to me, at least from what I've seen, people are actually trying to go, okay, we did this and we see that there is an issue with the security before we get way too out of hand and have these legacy systems we can't fix, how do we do this? And obviously we're still years away from truly being at a, a good Web3. Um, I went to East Denver here um, back in February and it was kind of insightful that like little things that I brought up, they're like, oh, I'm like, well, it's great that it's all peer reviewed, but how do you handle insider risk? Because if everybody's getting paid not or not getting paid or getting paid, like somebody's got to get compensated for doing all this peer review, right? So yep. at what point, like, and they're like, huh? And I'm like, yeah, that's something really big. I'm more worried about your insider risk messing with that than anything else because somebody's going to get upset that somebody made more or didn't make more and they, they feel like unjust, right? Um, but what are your <laughs> thoughts on like the, the future of Web3 and where it's going? And, and stuff I mean, I'll, like I'll tell you what, one place that has insider risk down to a T was Bank of America. That place, they insider risk, like that was an art form. They had that shit down to an art form. I will tell you that their fraud prevention is terrible. Well, every bank's well, fraud prevention is terrible. <laughs> well, they're, they're, so I can't speak specifically to their fraud prevention now, but right. back in the day when I worked with them, their fraud prevention actually was pretty baller because what they were doing is they said that like, hey, here's the acceptable fraud ceiling we're going to tolerate. We're going to try to tamp it down always. But, you know, they realize that there's a certain amount of fraud that's just going to happen. And when it like went above and it became too much, they would just drop the big elbow on it and do like much. Because the problem is if you're the things that you have to do to be anti-fraud in many cases are also anti-convenience. Mm. And at a certain point, you're, you're pushing away consumers or, you know, organizations that are using your service. And that, like, right, like, I can make a very, very secure bank that nobody will want to bank with because <laughs> you're going to have to give a blood sample before you <laughs> log in. Um but like getting back to the the web three, like the, I don't know, like there's really good and really bad. So, um, like some of the things that I'm really troubled with about the um, web three scene right now is like there's some really really toxic like tech bro type things, and like you know, I have yet to see a legit and like what I would consider a usable case for NFTs. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> now, I, I want to be clear, I am not anti-cryptocurrencies. Right. I think cryptocurrencies are a legitimate thing. I think blockchain is a valid thing. I think that where I start diverging <laughs> from a lot of the Web3 folks is one of the things that I always challenge people is when you say like, oh, blockchain, yay, right. can you swap blockchain with a access list or some sort of trusted list? And if you can just swap it with like that, blockchain, you don't need blockchain. Like a lot right. of times people are like, oh, it's the blockchain. And like they, they don't know, like it's, it's like just secret voodoo sauce. Um, I do think that like some smart contract stuff can be very very interesting yeah. and I I, um, I I don't know if you caught it but like I was like mm, when you were talking about the insider threat because I like I don't know like I it that is absolutely absolutely absent from every single threat matrix I've ever seen in this 
The mm-hmm. only thing that I've ever seen that kind of talks about it is if like what happens if somebody like just kind of goes crazy or like they lose their mind or whatever, like the system should in theory self-correct where you say like, hey, the reputation of this person tanked, but I do worry about that transition because there's going to be like, it won't be a gentle one. And I also worry about web three because when somebody has that like fall from grace, I don't know how the systems would allow them to like recover. Like what if, like, here's a scenario. What if you have like a a family member or close friend die and you're just like in a dark place and you're doing real like, ah, I'm angry and acting out wrong. Right. Right. Like, right. Like the, the system will shut them out, but Mm. how do you get back in? Like it's, um, there's a lot of, I don't know. Like I'm hopeful. I'll also tell you, I am worried as all hell. Um, so like, so, um, I'm trying to not be like too Debbie Downer here. But one of the things that I do worry about, like cryptocurrencies and all the um, processing that we're doing, like, like we're really burning up energy that we don't need to be burning up. Oh yeah, for sure. And we've got to come up with better ways of doing what we're doing. I think that um, the the worry that I have is like there's we're setting up like really perverse economic incentives for you to just be like, yeah, I'm going to shovel puppies into this furnace because they burn the best, you yeah, know, like, let's yeah. go cryptocurrency choo choo. Mm-hmm. And, um, there needs to be some way of making it so that the, the system like in a normal government, there's like accountability and as broken as government is, it, least they have to stand and face the voters a little bit like mm. these this system we're building i worry that there's no accountability yeah well i i would if i was going to dump money into something right now at this moment i think it would be cryptocurrency mm. just because the actions that we took against russia disconnecting them from swift they're going to start pushing cryptocurrency in russia guaranteed like they have no other way to kind of resuscitate their economy i think um and when we do sanctions, what is the first thing that happens when we put a sanction on a country financially? They go off and grab Bitcoin. Um, North Korea does it. China does it. But you, you raised a good point about the amount of energy it takes in order to make that run. And I think that if we're going to continue with cryptocurrency as a possibility of some sort of mainstream financial you know, system, they have to make it mineable for everybody, right? So unless you have a data center, a cold storage data center where you're like cranking through the the kilowatts per hour, you can't mine shit. Like, I mean, (laughs) there's just no way. Um, I've seen people with with, uh, a separate separate, um, electric line go into the house in order just to mine Bitcoin. And to me, if it's it's a financial system that we should all participate in, if we're gonna do it at all, but they need to make it available for everybody. I think that I loved uh, El Salvador's um, using of the volcano, the volcanic energy. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean it was like something like, but at the same time, like that turned green energy. But like my other question for the future of Web3 is like, once quantum computing truly gets to where it's accessible to everyone, like what does that do with all of that? Like, will that completely change absolutely everything once again i mean well it's on who gets it first (laughs) (laughs) yeah because because if the good guys get it like we'll be okay but if the bad guys get it don't worry about web (laughs) three don't worry about web (laughs) three what's going to happen is overnight the current internet is busted yeah It, it and I like I always tell uh, like my students, my clients, and anybody like, hey, when quantum drops, like if we if the bad guys get it, I'm gonna be off sailing or I'm out in the woods yeah. somewhere, and they're like, ha ha ha, and I'm like, no, nope, for real, I am I am not even I am for real for real right now, and then they're like, really, and I'm like, you have, like it is 
game the hell over. Yep. Yep. It, it, yeah. it is the table. Like that is the thing that keeps me up at night when I'm thinking internet is quantum. Quantum quantum bugs me. Um, true AI bugs me. And I, I think because we're not there and we will never be there unless we understand true consciousness um, and how decisions are actually made. But we're so far away from that. I think, you know, probably within the next five years, we may be a little bit closer to what AI should be. But I think right now, machine learning is probably the best that we have, um, advanced machine learning. Uh, but another, the, the, my pet peeve and what doesn't keep me up at night, but makes me want to kick somebody's teeth in, is metaverse. And, and the idea of having that, that virtual existence in another world where you could buy a Gucci handbag, but it's just like, you know, an in-game purchase. It's like $2,000, just like the, the regular version. And what I, I was talking, I was doing an a interview for a documentary last week. And they asked me about gaming and in-gaming purchases, rare items and all this stuff. And I thought kids base their value on what they have in that game. When they lose that character, it gets taken from them. It kills them. Like it literally depresses them and they can't function in the real world. Can you imagine how many people, adults, would be that way in metaverse if yeah. the same thing happened? Because you're going to have Kardashians on there with, you know, Lamborghinis and all these handbags and all this stuff. And normal people are going to want that same shit. So it's just, I, I think it's, it's toying with the, with the human psychology and making value seem something that it's not, right? So the, the inability to decipher personal value from in-game value and relying your, your, your confidence and, and your existence in the, in the physical world based on what you have in the virtual world, I think is a poison. We start out with the kids doing that and we fed it to the kids. Now we got Meta and, and that clan thinking that, hey, this is great. We should do it for adults too. And I think we're going to see a shitload of problems off the metaverse. Well, I think I agree with you because, but at the same time, I think that's also what, you know, our parents thought when the internet came out, like all of a sudden we're in this virtual reality and, but we actually are seeing the downsides now of what the internet can do. Like it can cause children to, you know, like go Be kill themselves because they, or lose all of their money or let you know, the parents, you know, bank accounts get drained because they went and bought something they weren't supposed to or get kidnapped or child, you know, so many things have gone wrong with it. I mean, there's just no, there's no safe way, but we've got to, like, part of it is where's that social responsibility of like, hey, we have to teach a child that the most important thing is your own self mentally, physically here. This is how you survive. And then once you understand that, that that boundary, right? Like this is fake. And yes, there, there can be money made and there are all these things and it's wonderful. You know, at the same time, like how do we teach that child? Like you have to go research, right? Like going back to like, you know, different sources. Um, there was actually, and this, this has been a while, but uh, at Burma, Facebook was automatically in, came with government sponsored phones. And so people in Burma thought that Facebook was the internet. They didn't know, like they're just handed technology for free and that's we did that though we did that with obama phones right well we've been doing it forever like i mean i knew like my scariest moment i'm i'm in panama going on a boat tour and these shacks are like falling down like no wall maybe part of a roof but you know what they had a claro tv on top a dish state-sponsored claro dish that's because marketing has taken over and they're not teaching marketing marketing is getting a little bit better because they've gotten backlash kind of same thing back with the smoking and the cigarettes back in movies and then we get, went away from it you can't share smoking in movies anymore because then kids get this like false sense you know marketing is ru ruling these things right like make more money you've got to be online you got to be a youtuber you got to have all these subscribers you got to do this if you don't you're not worth anything to us in the world right and, and it's okay. We want people like that. We need people like that. But we also like, where's that social responsibility going, kind of going back to the whole parent saying like, we've got to teach. This is what real life is. You may not get that job. Right. right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I, I'll tell you. So the metaverse thing, like, I, I actually, I'm not, I, I am very, I, I'm of two minds, okay? And it's really conflicting. I still am trying to resolve this. 
Mm-hmm. So like on one hand, I kind of am like good luck meta because like if if it were so compelling, I would have expected Second Life to have gone better than right. it did, right? But on the flip, um, I live in Columbus, Ohio. And like recently, my wife and I have got very much into sailing. Like last November, we had this amazing vacation and it was awesome. And she's like, honey, we need to get licensed so we can go charter boats. We live in Columbus, Ohio. There's not much sailing there. So one of the things that we did, in addition to all the like study guides and stuff that we're, um, we did, I bought an Oculus um, nice. uh, Oculus Quest, <laughs> and there's a virtual sailing game. And nice. it is bonkers cool how, like, they're like, okay, now grab the halyard and hoist it up this way, you know? And, like, I'm learning all these terms, and I'm, like, cranking the like grinding the the winch and all this mm-hmm. stuff and like it's like i'm getting to do something that i ne- like realistically couldn't do in the real world right like, I, I can't sail a 40 foot uh, down, uh, down the wabash <laughs> yeah like i just can't do that that's not a thing right. and so like it's i don't know like there's some potentials i gotta say though by and large a lot of the stuff that i've been seeing is like straight up stupid Right. Like, um, like there's this one uh, shopping VR shopping app where you're literally like you're you and your avatar are pushing a shopping cart and then you grab the virtual object and drop it into the virtual shopping cart. Who with a brain in their head's like, you know, you know what's not good is being able to go click, click, click. Instead, I'd really like it to re- recreate the most <laughs> annoying thing you have to do in the week. Right. Like, well, so Why? I had to break in. I found I was on the app store and it was like one of the pop up, you know, like top 10, you know, downloaded something. And one of them was like life organizer. And like I love put, like organizing things. So, yeah. like for me, but I mean, I would never want an app to do it. <laughs> like, but at the same time, I'm like, is this a thing? Could I, could I, could I have built this? I could have built this and I could have. It's kind of like the fart app, right? Like, wait, what, 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 like wait, 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 hold on. The 99 cent app, like, would have gone haywire, but, you know, but at the same time, is it teaching a kid how to shop for the first time, right? Like, is it teaching, like, okay. who is it for? Who's the aim? I mean, I think I agree with you 100%. So, so, so the key here, the key here is who is behind app? Who is actually dealing with the app? So all three of us, I, I think we're all in agreement that we would take the, the experience of metaverse and use it for a positive thing, right? Mm. But that's a very small percentage of the shit bags that live in the world. So what we see online is a direct resonance from what the world is like right now. It's just shit. You know, let's just face it. You got COVID, you got wars, you got corruption in government, you got people storing the White House, the Capitol, and that shit leads into the internet. Because those same people that are wearing, you know, the, the bison horns and running through the Capitol building, they're online as well. And so that's what we're seeing. And the reason why I say that metaverse scares the shit out of me is because those idiots are going to be in metaverse. And what could be a good experience or what could be a positive experience is going to be ruled by the mass, by the numbers. And I hate to say it, but the numbers in the U.S. don't really reflect a lot of responsibility responsible people and, and outstanding citizens so you're going to get that same chaos that same real life physical you know just bag of shit onto the internet and that's what we're, we're going to see in like metaverse for anyone who has not already seen it like that's watching this podcast there is a movie called the gamer and this is one of one of the reasons not just the gamer, there's several. Even Wally kind of addresses lots of things that are happening right now where everybody is just stuck into uh, a phase or a, a place. Like things can go amazing. It can be used for good, it can be used for bad. But like that's where I really believe like an art represents art is the first stage before the like actual life happens, right? Well, that's so that's the desensitization of- area. So they yeah. use art to desensitize you for what's coming up next. And art imitation. They're trying to show you like, hey, this this could happen. 
But at the same time, you are right. A lot of times it just desensitizes us of the fact that like, hey, by the way, like, yeah, okay, I'll be fat and drink the Slurpee in a rolly chair and outer space and it's fine, you know, whatever. <laughs> so, so what are your thoughts on that, Nick, when it comes to life and bleeding into the internet? Because I think a lot of the problems we see on the internet <clears throat> is not only because the internet sped up that connection to where I can talk to somebody across the world in like two seconds, but it's also what type of person is behind that and what experience they're having in life and bringing it to the internet. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that the thing that I try to keep in mind is like, the th so the internet kind of collapses humanity into exactly the situation where we can chat with one another and just exchange ideas all, all day, every day. Um, I do worry that, like, you know, it used to be that you would have that that crazy drunk uncle, you know, you're like, oh, that's Drunkle Bill right. doing his crazy stuff. And you could kind of write him off, but now the internet makes it easy for all of these folks have a platform to like oh oh you're you're one of my kind and you know they get like this critical mass together and you know it, and so i think that extremism on all of its types is a serious problem and that there needs to be some way of like for like quote unquote normal people that are willing to have conversations that you can have like like hey here's how we respect people that we violently disagree with but we can come to middle ground, but, but there's also some people that were like, nah, you're out of the pool because like, if somebody's like, like, well, my opinion is I got to kill McDouglas. Hey, like, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to talk you down from that. Like you need to get away. Right. And like, I think that, I think that some people are too like hippy dippy on like everybody's thoughts are important. No, no, they're some not. Some people aren't. <laughs> And then other thing is, you know, I think that some people take that side too much and they're like, well, you know, if, if you don't roll up your sleeves, just so like, you're, you're not cool. a bad person and I got to right. kill you. You know, right. that's what Mitch said. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we've got to have like some kind of like, you, you got to be this high to ride the ride in terms of civility. And if you don't cross that barrier, like you get to go. Like we should have like this crazy net where you can just go bonkers. Yeah, yeah. And there should be like a more genteel kind of like, but like I don't know, like how do you make that that threshold and not be like crazy? Yeah. And, and that can vary. See, the the crazy thing is worldwide. You're talking about that can vary from community to community. Oh yeah, person, like state to state. I mean, we're talking about like we've done this for the entire internet worldwide, right? So like how do you find that middle ground right because that, and that's kind of where this extremism it's either oh well you can have everything and be as mean as you want on this side and then you have the other people who are like but no you can't say you can't even say a cuss word well a cuss word could be like you know i don't know something darn you know, you know like just something stupid i know I <laughs> <laughs> darn. darn yeah exactly but again, so how do you find that middle it's really it's really hard you know? follow me I'll, I'll create the middle ground <laughs> <laughs> then we'll I mean, all that's be a trouble. great idea <laughs> right <laughs> no <laughs> so we are at the end of the hour and Mick I gotta say man I've been trying to hook up with you to do this podcast for months man it yeah, is but our it's awesome. are both crazy. crazy. Yeah, but I, I'll tell you what, man. It's been awesome talking to you. We need to keep in touch, man. Hell yeah. Uh, I would love dude, like, I would love to do another one of these or just even just shoot the shit, just, like, hanging with you. But, yeah, I would, man. like, have me on again. I would love it. This was absolutely. This was a blast. I love yeah, it. I'm glad to have, finally have made, like, finally got you on here, like, meet you in person. Um, I know you just... You're so busy. And thank you, by the way. I want to say thank you because, one, I know that you work with SANS and you've got your own thing going. But the fact that you are doing internships and mentoring people, like, that's what we really need. Um, I know we all talk about certs. Cert, cert, they, they serve a purpose. But um, truly having people that mentor and give internships based off of who people are and not what they have on a piece of paper um, you know, I just want to say thank you. And that's really awesome. So yeah, makes it makes a great dude. He was my voice of reason 
when I was working at Bank of America. Back then, that was, back, that then was <laughs> back then, I wasn't exactly cool headed and I wasn't that mature. So, but uh, well, it cuts both ways though. There were a couple times where I was like, yo, like this is pretty jacked up. And you would be like, well, you know, this, this, this. So uh, don't. Nah, I'm not gonna let you uh, say like that you were totally punk in. Although when the thing was when that bit got flipped on you, you'd be like, table flip. <laughs> true, very true. But I, I've I've grown up a little bit. Well, maybe not. Um, but anyways, I was like, don't brag too much. <laughs> but it, it was great having you on, Mick, and I definitely have you on again. And uh, oh, yeah. you know. When I'm traveling through the uh, speaking circuit this year, I'm going to see if I can't drop down in, in Ohio somewhere. I'll be in Pennsylvania okay. at the end of this month again, um, okay. Western Pennsylvania. So maybe we can connect somehow. But anyways, for, for the listeners, thanks for listening. Subscribe. There's not a banner here for YouTube, but subscribe to YouTube. Um, and look for two podcasts, this one and the previous one to be released next week. Uh, and it'll be on Tech Strong T. Thank you, Tech Strong, for replaying the uh, the broadcast. And that's it. I'll see you guys next week. Thanks, Mick. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. <laughs>